it's on the management of a kin endometrium and the second is the istanbul consensus workshop on embryo assessment as to how do you go about assessing the oocytes and embryo quality now we all know that assessing the endometrium has become an essential part of a component in assisted reproduction uh, when the endometrium is assessed to be thin the physicians and the patient face a decision as to whether to proceed or not to proceed with the treatment cycle so with this key component as the background i will take you through this paper as to what are the recommendations and what are the evidences on which this has been found so this guideline seeks to provide an evidence based approach to the assessment and management of patients with thin endometrium in assisted reproduction and this includes both ovarian stimulation without ivf and also in ivf cycles it is important to know that this guideline focuses primarily on the issue of endometrial thickness additional methods of assessment including the pattern volume or doppler are not addressed within the scope of this guideline so i will restrict this talk as to what is based on this particular paper from the canadian fertility society now there are three dilemmas that a clinician faces one is the effect of the endometrial thickness on the outcome second even more basic is the definition itself of what amounts to a thin endometrium and third what are the variations if any within the endometrial thickness in its measurement we start off with two major publications the first paper in fertility sterility by kumar swami and peter broads group which looked at the relationship between endometrial thickness and the outcome in medicated frozen embryo transfer replacement cycle and this paper concluded that if the endometrial thickness is between 9 to 14 on the day when progesterone is started it gives a higher implantation and a pregnancy rate compared to patients who have an endometrium of 7 or 8 mm there is another paper which looks at the assessment of endometrium by 3d ultrasound and by power doppler and this paper concluded that the average endometrial thickness in the pregnant and the non pregnant group was 12 mm and there was no difference in the average endometrial thickness between patients who conceive and patients who did not conceive so we know that there are some studies which have found that a thin endometrial thickness negatively affects the pregnancy rate after fertility treatment while there are other studies which do not confirm this finding and this lack of consensus can possibly be explained by the fact that there is no exact definition of what amounts to a thin endometrium as assessed by ultrasound despite all this assessing the endometrial thickness has become an integral part of the monitoring in all forms of fertility treatments so let us start with the basic about how do you measure the endometrial thickness now the endometrium should always be measured in the sagittal plane or in the long axis of the uterus it is the measurement of the thickest and ecogenic stroma from one stratum basalis to the other stratum basalis so the, we look at the interface between the stratum basalis and the surrounding myometrium from one end to the other this measurement is usually found within 1 cm from the fundal tip now to measure this you could have certain obstacles in the form of some kinds of uterine pathologies or position and flexion of the uterus acute antiversion flexion acute deviations and there could also be inter and intra observer variation so even though in principle this appears to be a very simple thing there could be issues when you measure the endometrial thickness there is also evidence that uterine contractions also interfere into this now uterine contractions can cause the endometrial thickness to change by up to 3 or 4 mm so it is a significant uh, difference and most patients have multiple contractions per minute 
So this sermons to the problems related to position or pathology that contractions in the uterus, which is a physiological thing, can also affect this. This contractions, the frequency of the contraction also differs within different stages of the menstrual cycle, depending on the circulating estrogen and progesterone levels. So what is recommended is that to have the most accurate and relevant measurement, we should wait for a wave to pass and measure again, or still better, take three measurements and use the average of all three for recording the endometrial thickness. We then come to the second part and that is how do you define a thin endometrium? Now this definition or the cutoff for thin endometrium differs between different studies, but most studies use a thickness of either less than seven or less than eight on the day of HCG or the start of progesterone as a definition of thin endometrium. But this seven or eight is also a big change. However, in the literature, pregnancies have also been described in ovarian stimulation cycles with endometrial thicknesses as low as 3.8 millimeters on the day of HCG. The second issue is what is the incidence of this thin endometrium? This is a very large Canadian ART database, nearly 40,000 cycles. What they have seen is that if you look at about 22,000 fresh embryo transfers, in 12.3% of the cycles, the endometrium was less than 8, and in 3.9%, it was less than 7. When we compare this with frozen embryo transfers, in about 14%, it was less than 8, and in 3%, it was less than 7. So, the issue is how common this is, and if you look at the conclusion of this paper, it is mentioned that this is most likely to be an underestimation of the true incidence because this only represents cycles which proceeded to an embryo transfer. We do not know what the actual incidence would have been if we included all cycles where the transfer was cancelled because the endometrium was smaller than this. That would give us the true incidence. So if you look at all IVF studies, if you put in a cutoff of less than 7 millimeter, this incidence varies between 1 to 2.5%. But if you extend this to controlled ovarian stimulation cycles, the non-IVF scenario, either with oral or with gonadal protein, the incidence increases to between 5.6% to as high as 37.9%. But two very important points to note here. One, that all the studies describe the incidence of thin endometrium during one ART cycle. There is no consensus on what defines a persistent thin endometrium because this is what we are worried about. Because whether we need to know whether this persists in different cycles or this is an isolated phenomenon occurring in one particular cycle. And there are no studies which are describing or mentioning what is a persistent thin endometrium over multiple cycles. What this paper concluded was that thin endometrium in ART is defined as an endometrial thickness of less than 7 or less than 8. The incidence in ovarian stimulation cycles could be as high as between 40 to 66 percent, but in IVF cycle it varies between 1 to 2 and a half percent. Again, this also mentioned that this is likely to be an underestimation of the true incidence, especially in IVF cycles, because there is no inclusion of cancelled cycles. What could be the possible causes of this thin endometrium? Now, the commonest issues are it could be an inflammatory cause, where because of the inflammation, there is destruction of the basal layer, because the healing in this case is then takes place by fibrosis which destroys the endometrium and shrinks the uterine cavity. And tuberculosis being the commonest cause in India for this scenario. Second, it could be an iatrogenic issue, either surgical because of repeated or vigorous curettage, or following hysteroscopic myomectomy, polypectomy, or laparoscopic myomectomy where the cavity has been opened. Or it could be medical because of indiscriminate use of drugs. Most commonly, it is idiopathic, 
or it could be because of poor vascularity and low estradiol levels. It could be because of postpartum endometritis and septic abortions. And obviously, we will find it in patients who have hypogonadotrophic, hypogonadism, premature ovinate failure, or a Mullerian anemone. But the endometrium can also be inherently thin in some women or completely idiopathic without any known cause. Now, how do you go about investigating this patient? Now, most studies have only included patients with a normal cavity assessment. But some studies have also used other modalities. And although it is difficult to estimate the incidence in, of intrauterine pathology in patients with thin endometrium, uterine cavity assessment by hysteroscopy or sonohistrogram is a low risk procedure and it should be carried out to identify patients who might require some surgical management. So, what does this paper conclude? First of all, the strength of evidence is weak. And although intrauterine, the incidence of intrauterine adhesions in patients with thin endometrium is unknown, the uterine assessment may significantly identify patients who are likely to benefit with a surgical management. Let us now move on to the issue of thin endometrium in ovarian stimulation cycles. These are non-IVF cycles, either simple ovulation induction with or without an IUL. The clinician here have to consider whether to proceed with the treatment cycle or to cancel the cycle. Now I'll take you through some papers which have looked at the endometrial thickness in IUI cycle. Now this is a paper, 348 cycles, looking at predictive factors for pregnancy during first four IUI cycles using gonadotrophins alone. And what this concluded was that an endometrial thickness below 7 millimeters was unfavorable to predict clinical. There is another paper, this is, which looks at endometrial thickness in patients stimulated with clomiphene or for intrauterine examination a prospective study of 168 couples. And this paper concluded that there was no difference in the endometrial thickness between patients who conceived versus who did not conceive. Both had an average endometrial thickness of 7.0 millimeter. This is the systematic review and meta-analysis looking at 17 RCTs, six cohort studies, endometrial thickness in women undergoing IUI with ovarian stimulation, and how thick is too thin. Again, there was no evidence of a difference in the endometrial thickness between women who conceived and women who did not conceive. Also, there was no evidence for a difference in thickness between the clomiphene and the letrozole group. But in patients who were stimulated with clomiphene or letrozole versus gonadotrophins, the clomiphene and letrozole group had a thinner endometrium. So the question then comes is that after encountering a thin endometrium in the first cycle, what do the clinicians do? And the most common thing that the clinician will do is switch the stimulation medication. Now, does this work? Now, this is a very good paper which looked at stimulation with tamoxifen or alternate day gonadotropins in patients who had a thin endometrium in a previous cycle. They looked at 160 patients who had a history of a thin endometrium of less than 8 and they were subsequently stimulated with tamoxifen followed by gonadotrophin. And what they found that the pregnancy rates were higher in spontaneous abortion rates and, and, and thinner endometrium was lower in the tamoxifen. However, such publications are very few. So even though clinicians might try adjuvants, the use of adjuvants to improve this has not yet been studied, and we will look at the use of the adjuvants. The first is the use of aspirin, and again, I'm looking at non IVF cycles. So, low dose aspirin in patients with thin endometrium undergoing intrauterine insemination. But mind you, this was a non blinded RCT, small groups of patients, but this did show a benefit in the pregnancy rate. 
even though the endometrial thickness also increased from 5.8 to 7.2. But this is only one such publication. What about sildenafil? In patients with Asherman syndrome, marginal increase in endometrial thickness, but nothing related to the pregnancy outcome. And this is very too new patient. So this particular guideline paper concluded that if we look at clinical pregnancy rates, defining a thin endometrium thickness as minus 7 millimeter, there are only two observational studies with very low quality evidence. If you look at clinical pregnancy rate up to less than 8, again, only one observational study, very low quality evidence. If we move to endometrial thickness of less than 6, again, only one observational study. But if you look at the mean endometrial thickness in pregnant versus non-pregnant patients, there is a systematic review and meta-analysis. And even though the avid quality of evidence is here, still low. So in non-IVF scenarios, there is very little evidence as to what should be defined as a thin endometrium. But most studies do point towards the fact that if the endometrium is less than 7 millimeters, the chances of a pregnancy could be low. So the summary statement of this group shows is that thin endometrium may not impact pregnancy outcome in stimulation treatment cycles. Second, patients undergoing ovarian stimulation with thin endometrium may be counseled that the effect on pregnancy rates is still unclear because the cutoffs are not known. In ovarian stimulation cycle, there is insufficient evidence to recommend changing stimulation medical stimulation medications because there is insufficient evidence to support it. And there is also insufficient evidence to recommend the use of various techniques. So the only thing that we know or we could conclude from this papers or this evidence is that the likelihood of a pregnancy could be low if the endometrium is below 7 and we should counsel the patients about this possibility. We then move on to the issue of thin endometrium in IVF cycles and we will look at both fresh and the frozen transfer cycle. Again, most studies in this are retrospective and they are majorly looking on fresh IVF cycles. There is only a small subset looking at frozen embryo transfer. So observational studies of fresh IVF cycles have indicated a decreased chance of pregnancy or a live birth with thin endometrium. However, all the studies have used different cutoffs to define a thin endometrium. And let me take you through some of these major publications. This is a large study, more than 10,000 fresh IVF cycles. Grouping endometrium into four categories, less than 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 15, and more than 15. And what this study concluded, that the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate increased as the thickness moved from the less than 8 millimeter group to the more than 15 millimeter group. And correspondingly, the abortion rates and the ectopic pregnancy rates decreased as the endometrial thickness moved from the thinnest group to the thickest group. This is a very good study which looked at endometrial pattern, not thickness, in patients who were undergoing a frozen called embryo transfer of euploid embryos. These are transfer of patients after a PG. And what this study concluded that the clinical pregnancy rate was not significantly different in patients who had an endometrial thickness of 7 or less versus more than 7 when we look at the transfer of this euploid embryo. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at 1170 studies, very large study, which showed that there is no difference in live birth or ongoing pregnancy rate for patients who have less than 7 millimeters. It's a 2014 paper. And this concluded that the use of endometrial thickness as a tool to decide on cycle cancellation, freezing of all embryos, or refraining from further evidence, further IVF treatment seems not to be justified based on the current meta-analysis. And we still need more studies 
so you can see that there is a lot of confusing literature on this again we come back to the old canadian database 40000 ivf cycles and they showed that the clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rates decreased and the pregnancy rates increased pregnancy loss rate increased with each millimeter decline in the endometrial thickness below 8 mm and they looked at endometriums of 8 and above 7 to 8 6 to 7 and 5 to 6 and with each decrease in millimeter in the thickness of endometrium this shows that there is a drop in the live birth this is one of the largest studies looking at a large data set this is in fresh site what about around more than 19000 frozen embryo transfer site there was no change in the pregnancy loss rate but here also the live birth rates kept on decreasing with each millimeter decrease in the endometrial thickness from 28% at more than 8 mm to 15% if it is between 5 to 6 very interestingly what this paper also showed that the likelihood of achieving a thicker endometrium decreases with age which means that as the patient's age advances the chances of her having a thinner endometrium increases this is the first such publication which mentions that aging not only affects the oocyte quality but it also has a negative effect on the endometrial thickness this paper looks at nearly 4000 cycles predominantly oocyte donation and on hrt and what this study shows that there is no significant difference in the pregnancy rates and endometrial thickness of more than 5 mm is a reasonable parameter for determining treatment and this study also mentions that once it is observed observed in a single ultrasound evaluation there is not even a need for subsequent monitoring so possibly in patients who have a thinner endometrium the quality of the oocyte and the embryo plays a major role as compared to what one would see when the endometrium is good this is a study by chen which looked at fresh it in patients who had endometrium of less than 8 and in such patients they did an all freeze and transferred in a subsequent hrt cycle and this showed that doing a freeze all if the endometrium is poor and doing a subsequent transfer in a hrt cycle where the endometrium is better the outcomes are good this is a very small study only 23 so what did this group conclude this is a long conclusion but let us go through one by one what they have essentially done is the first two rows are looking at clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate if we use a cut off of less than 8 Second to our clinical pregnancy and live birth rate, if you use the cutoff for seven, the next two, if you use the cutoff of less than six millimeter. In all the categories, if you see, the quality of evidence is pretty low because there are only major observational studies. So the problem here is because of lack of prospectively randomized studies, you cannot come to definite conclusion. based on the endometrial thickness what they recommended was first that in patients who are undergoing fresh ivf embryo transfer cycle patient should be counseled that if endometrial thickness is less than 8 it can have a negative impact on the pregnancy birth second in this patients who are undergoing fresh embryo transfer cycles if the endometrium is less than 8 they can be offered elective cryopreservation of embryos and transfer in a subsequent however if this happens in a frozen embryo transfer and if the endometrium is less than 7 mm they should be counseled that they this can have a negative impact on the pregnancy rate so the cutoff being proposed for fresh cycles is less than 8 and that being proposed for frozen embryo transfer is less than 7 also showed that for patients with the history of thin endometrium undergoing hrt cycle there is insufficient evidence that any specific protocol either a natural cycle or a modified natural or a hrt cycle could lead to 
a better endometrial preparation because there are no studies which have compared different endometrial preparation protocols in patients who have a thin endometrium undergoing a frozen embryo transfer. We then come to the last part and that is the role of various adjuvants in treating thin endometrium. We shall look at aspirin, luteal estradiol, sildenafil citrate, DCSF and any other now, although aspirin has been commonly used as an adjuvant in assisted reproduction cycles, primarily on an empirical basis for thin endometrium, there is only one small and a non-blinded RCT that has been used. And this is the RCT, which looked at 38 recipients, very small, who were undergoing oocyte donation and who failed to develop an endometrial thickness of 8 millimeters. You can see that in the low dose aspirin group and in the aspirin group, the number of patients are very low. But this did show that there is a statistically significant increase in the implantation rates in the aspirin treated group, 24% versus 9%, even though there was no demonstrable increase in the endometrial thickness in the aspirin group. What about the addition of estradiol? In patients. This is a paper where 57 patients were given 4 mg of estradiol from the day of HCG till 12 weeks of gestation, compared with 60 patients who did not receive this adjuvant therapy. And this showed that there is no significant difference in either the endometrial thickness at egg retrieval or on the pregnancy or on the live birth rate. Third is the use of sildenafil citrate. Single paper, RCT of 80 patients who had an antecedent of poor endometrial response in frozen embryo transfer. They were given 50 milligram of additional sildenafil to their routine stimulation protocol. And this showed that the endometrial thickness was higher and the implantation and chemical pregnancy rates were higher, but it was not. What about the role of GCS? Now, GCSF is synthesized in humans to promote the development of new growth. We have a recombinant form of this human growth factor because it has been used for various indications like transient bone marrow failure following cytotoxic chemotherapy. It has been used in aplastic anemia and in HIV-associated protein. The first study on this came from Norman Gleischer's group, which showed successful treatment of an unresponsive thin endometrium by administering. Then came another study again from Gleischer 2013, which was the pilot cohort study. 21 women with an endometrium of less than 7 millimeters on the day of HCG. Previous cycles using the traditional treatment with estradiol, sildenafil or beta blockers had been unsuccessful. And in this patient's ECSF was administered by an intrauterine catheter by slow infusion before noon on the day of HCG. And if the endometrium had not reached 7 mm within 48 hours, a second infusion was given following oocyte retrieval. This study showed that there was an increase in the endometrial thickness after the administration of GCSF. But this change did not vary in patients who conceived or who did not conceive and they observed a 19.1 ongoing clinical pregnancy. The subsequent study by Gleischer, Fertility Sterility 2014, a randomized control trial, 141 patients, 73 patients on GCSF, 68 on the placebo, the implantation rates of 12 and 16, pregnancy rates of 24 plus 27.9, and this was not statistically significant and he concluded that there is no benefit of this particular therapy. So if you look at another study, again an RCT of endometrial perfusion of GCSF concluded that GCSF does not affect endometrial thickness or clinical pregnancy. But this was given in normal IVF patients, not in patients who had thin endometrial. So there have been contradictory evidences 
some very small study showing that it has a benefit, but majority of the study showing that it does not have a benefit. However, the major issue is that even though no side effects have been reported with intrauterine infusion of DCSF, there are serious concerns about the systematic about the systemic use of GCSF because there is an increased risk of therapy related myeloid neoplasm, increased risk of sickle cell crisis and multi organ failures, and it has also been associated with bone pain. So the systemic use of GCSF has definite risk of we now move on to pentoxifiline. Now, this is a methylxanthine derivative which causes vasodilatation, and this is how it is thought to increase the blood flow to the endometrium. Again, a small study, only 20 cases, which showed that there is a marginal increase in the endometrial thickness in nearly 73% of the patients, and 40% of this conceived out of the three were actually natural pregnancies. But these are all individual case studies. There are no control studies available. What about PRP and stem cell uh, infusion? Now, this is again a study looking at intrauterine infusion of PRP into the uterine cavity on the 10th day of HRT and embryos were transferred when the endometrial thickness reached more than seven. This showed successful endometrial expansion and pregnancy in patients after PRP. But small study, not a randomized control trial. And this is one of the largest study looking at the infusion of stem cells, autologous cell therapy in patients who had refractory endometrial Asherman syndrome. But here, the stem cells were created outside and they were transfused into the uterine cavity by the role of femoral artery catheterization under uh, a CCTV guidance. And this showed that there was a significant improvement in the endometrial thickness from 4.3 to 6.7. And four of the five patients expressed an improvement in cavity. This also showed a pregnancy rate. But what do the guidelines conclude? On aspirin, it suggests against the use of aspirin. Luteal estradiol, we suggest against the use of luteal estradiol because no benefit seen in the one small observational study. About the use of sildenafil, again, insufficient evidence because there is no improvement in pregnancy rate in this poorly designed RCT. What about the use of intrauterine GCSF? Weak evidence. This concludes that it should against the use of DCSF because there is no benefit in the clinical pregnancy or the live birth rate in the RCT. What about pentoxifiline, HCG, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist, or PRP or stem cell? There are no control studies reported, and this should be used only under the setting of clinical trial. To conclude, Physicians must balance the prognosis for patients if they want to proceed with treatment with a thin endometrium or consider alternative treatment. Currently, there is minimal evidence to support any specific protocol or adjuvant to specifically improve pregnancy outcome in patients with a thin endometrium. Thank you all. Now I pass on.